Hello and welcome. I'm Caroline Woods, and today we're here to discuss the whys and wherefores of the $15 million capital raise by listed diagnostics business Option. Option describes itself as a precision medicine company harnessing the power of molecular diagnostics and bioinformatics to help combat infectious disease. Perhaps the most exciting part of its mission is to lengthen the life of current antibiotics in the face of growing antimicrobial resistance, also known as AMR. A significant threat to humanity, AMR has already cost the U.S. healthcare system an estimated $20 billion and is now set to spiral into a global pandemic with projections of up to 10 million deaths by 2050. On October 4th, Option's fight against AMR reached a significant milestone. It's a Qatas AMR gene panel, which is able to detect 28 different genetic markers associated with AMR, from sample to answer in hours, not days, was cleared by the FDA. With the panel's commercial launch already underway, Option has also opened and closed a $15 million capital raise. To the outside world, it seems like a swift change in pace for the business. After an elongated period of waiting for the FDA, everything is now moving very quickly. And while shareholders prepare to vote on the increase in common stock from 50 million to 100 million shares of common stock, management has faced many questions from investors, not least regarding voting rights and dilution, which is why today we'll be putting CEO Oliver Schacht on the spot and asking for clarity. So let's get right into it. Can you help us understand Option's busy start to the fourth quarter of 2021? Absolutely. I mean, look, it's been a really exciting start to the fourth quarter of 2021. After more than two years of waiting for the FDA clearance, we finally got Option's first ever molecular diagnostics product cleared by the FDA. And this allows us to commercialize the Acuitas AMR gene panel right away. It's the final piece of moving Option from being an R&D uh, company to being a truly commercial driven enterprise poised for growth in the coming years. Let's talk about the significance of the FDA clearance for Acuitas a little bit more. Sure. I mean, getting FDA clearance is always a tough hurdle. This is now the third product that Option as a group, together with our subsidiary Creatus, has successfully pushed over the regulatory finish line with the United States FDA. And it's the third product that we'll now be offering commercially here in the US as an in vitro diagnostic. We certainly think that it helps reduce the risk profile of the company from a perspective of investors. And over time, hopefully being appreciated by the capital markets who now understand better our emerging commercial profile. It may also help reduce the risk that the market attaches to any of our future FDA submissions. We clearly have a team that knows how to run these clinical trials and knows how to get stuff through the FDA. I think it's fair to say there's been some concern over the structure and impact of the capital raise, especially how it will affect existing shareholders. Could you describe the, the mechanics in more detail? Absolutely. I, back in June, July, and August, we had proposed to our shareholder meeting, which we had to adjourn twice due to insufficient voter turnout, that we should increase the authorized common stock. We had already stated back then that the path, if that pathway were not become, uh, to become available to us at option, we might have to resort to issuing and using the authorized preferred stock, which is what we've now done for our financing. Since we did not receive approval due to a lack of sufficient shareholder voting overall at the meeting, we've now issued 150,000 preferred stock out of a total of 10 million authorized preferred in order to complete this financing. The board, after detailed and extensive discussions with NASDAQ, has attached 30,000 votes to each of these preferred shares, which was an important consideration for the investor who bought this 15 million of stock. But to be clear, these votes and these voting rights are exclusively for the two specific items that are now proposed at the special meeting to be held on December 8th of 2021. Namely, the reduction of the required majority in our charter from 66 and two thirds percent down to 50% plus a share, as well as secondly, the authorization of the increase of common share. To be absolutely clear, the holders of preferred stock cannot vote and will not vote on any other item, not now, 
not ever. To enshrine this option in accordance with NASDAQ rules to use is now going to use a mirroring voting mechanism. For all subsequent votes, the common stockholders will vote and they'll vote first. The holders of the preferred will not vote. However, the votes of the preferred stock will then be allocated and they'll be allocated in the exact same percentage split as the result of the common vote. At which point you might ask, well, why bother? Well, there's a big benefit to all shareholders. Preferred shareholder votes are allocated automatically. And this means there'll almost certainly be enough votes to reach a decision. It also guarantees that the decision will also be one that reflects the opinion of those common stockholders who vote and not necessarily the opinions of the board, what we're asking for, or those who do not bother to vote at all. This is good for everyone because it means that we can get decisions taken and then move forward. We're very fortunate and blessed to enjoy a lot of popularity with retail investors. However, one less positive consequence has been the money and resources and energy we've had to expend on proxy solicitation to gain a quorum, which is why two thirds of the common stockholders who voted this summer, and they voted to support the proposal to increase the common authorized stock. This new mechanic that we've now chosen ensures that their voices and their votes will continue to be heard. There is no automatic dilution from any increase in authorized but not issued stock, but we'll have the flexibility, frankly, as every biotech company that is pre-profitability needs to have to access the capital markets from time to time. Oliver, let's talk about that capital raise a little bit more. What is Option going to do with the $15 million raised? Well, as we've outlined in our SEC filings, the $15 million additional financing will allow us here at Option to continue, continue executing on our business strategy. As of October 2021, we now have close to $40 million of cash on our balance sheet. If we can use all of that for operations rather than having to use the extra cash to repay debt, then we'll have quite some runway given our continued guidance at a cash burn expected to be in the five to $6 million range per quarter. But what that means is we can focus on the commercial launch and rollout of the acute as AMR product here in the US. We can also focus on driving commercial ramp up of our Univero business, both here in the United States, as well as globally. We have clinical trials for urinary tract infection, and we're planning a clinical trial for invasive joint infections to start. Uh, these trials also need to be funded. And then furthermore, our Iris Genetics bioinformatics subsidiary, which has recently launched its first ever commercial software offering, the Iris Cloud, will continue the commercial rollout of its offering and services, not only in Europe, we're also intending and planning to bring our genetics here to the United States. And that will take dedicated commercial and operational roles and resources in 2022 and beyond. What the $15 million does as well is it provides us an option, an additional option to potentially repay the first tranche of the European Investment Bank or EIB debt, which becomes due in April of 2022. That's 10 million euros plus 3 million euros in accrued, in accrued interest. So roughly $15 million. However, our preferred route and preferred approach would be to restructure the EIB debt. And we've begun discussions to that end with the EIB, looking at potential structures, including the possibility of potentially converting the debt into equity over time. Again, one of the reasons we need those authorized common shares. We'd love if you could walk us through some other details of the raise. Uh, why wasn't it open to the public? And how did you select the buyer? Sure. Well, look, this is a very unique transaction and a very unique set of circumstances. There was a rather list, narrow list, uh, short list of potential buyers to begin with. Uh, our stipulation was and is that obviously these preferred shares are not freely tradable. And there was no guarantee that there will be authorized common stock for these preferred shares to convert into. So, um, you know, there's obviously a certain element of risk here to the investor. We also had a very clearly defined timeline. Meanwhile, feedback from our banking advisors uh, from the dialogue with a number of potential institutional buyers of this type of transaction was that we would have needed to tailor to very specific asks for individual investors to each and every one who might have bought into that. And under these circumstances, 
The deal with a single investor, uh, a professional institutional investor uh, who knows the company and has supported option in the past in previous financings made most sense. And the warrants that we've attached at a strike price of $2.05, which have the potential to bring in another up to $15 million to option, also made perfect sense. Now that said, of course, it remains and continues to be our objective on the IR front to bring in long-term healthcare investors as institutional backers to option and our story, but that doesn't happen overnight. And it requires patience, perseverance, continued execution on the fundamentals, and for that, we just need authorized common stock. From what I understand, shareholders are also asking questions about insider buying and whether the ultimate stock dilution is worth the price being paid. How are you answering those questions? Look, myself, my family, including my uh, minor son, our chief operating officer, Jan Bacher, we've recently bought shares, both at the $2.25 as well as the $3.08 price points. We're, we fundamentally believe in the growth potential and value creation opportunity that option provides. A huge proportion of my own personal uh, potential upside and long-term value is equity linked, be it through stock options that vest over multiple years, be it in restricted stock units, and at these current price levels, there's basically zero value in those. So our interest, my personal interest, is 100% aligned with each and every common stockholder out there in the future value creation of option stock. Oliver, what's the expectation of further capital raises? Well, as I've said before, we've now almost $40 million cash on the balance sheet here in October. Uh, with the uh, seven and a half million warrants at the two dollar five strike price, and another seven point seven million warrants that are in the three dollar fifty five and three dollar fifty six, respectively, we have the potential for more than forty two point six million dollars of additional cash coming into option in the coming years. There's currently no specific plans for any other financing transactions. However, that said, we need to retain the flexibility. If one looks at successful companies, especially in our space of uh, molecular diagnostics for infectious disease and platforms, we've seen some successful exits recently. The likes of Genmark, um, Mesa Biotech, Mobidiac, um, Luminex. One of the things all of these companies have in common is they were properly financed, financed to execute and to grow the business. And they've been able, given that strong financial backing, to negotiate very profitable uh, arrangements and mergers and acquisitions as an ultimate exit for their shareholders. So we believe that that's a common theme, strong fun fundamentals, as well as strong financial backing that will ultimately create these types of opportunities. If shareholders refuse to approve the increase in authorized common shares, what are the consequences? Well, look, I mean, prior to the $15 million financing, as, as per our quarterly filings with the SEC, our cash reach would have been until April of 2022, when the first EIB debt tranche becomes due. With that 15 million financing, we've now extended that by somewhere between two and three quarters. In my view, shareholders would be a lot worse off if Option had to actually repay the EIB, the 13 million euros, or $15 million in April of 2022 in cash, rather than us having the option to carefully and smartly restructure the debt over time. This proposal and the potential to consider equitizing that debt delivers a significant reduction in cash burn. The only way to achieve that otherwise in terms of cash reduction would be to start scrapping commercial activities, stopping clinical trials, reducing operations and staffing, all of which we believe would be a huge loss in terms of shareholder value. Well, on that note, there are also some operational questions being asked. Could we turn to some of those now? Yes, of course. Great, thank you. So a month on from approval, where is option with the launch of Acuitas? Is there a sales pipeline for the panel? Yes, absolutely. Look, we prepared a launch plan, all of the marketing collateral. We had trained the sales team prior to obtaining FDA clearance. We had also, as previously announced on multiple occasions, manufactured multiple batches of product of these Acuitas AMR kits. Immediately upon receiving FDA clearance, we've begun a major marketing and sales outreach campaign, addressing several hundred institutions in the United States, and within those, well over a thousand stakeholders, individuals. 
Now, to manage people's expectations, though, this is a first in class, a first ever one of its kind molecular diagnostic solution. Sales cycles in our industry tend to be in the six to 12 month range. While we have certainly generated some leads and have also worked very closely over the last couple of years with several hospitals and labs across the state of New York, the marketing and sales effort can now only begin in full force. This will be a story to evolve and unfold for 2022 and beyond. Can you also provide any update on the progress internationally, as well as the performance of options, other products? Sure. I mean, at this point, we do not have any plans to commercialize the Acutus AMR product anywhere outside of the United States. We don't have any regulatory clearances, be it in Europe or Asia PAC, for that product. And so our focus for Acutus AMR remains squarely on the U.S. market especially with the European uh, IVDR regulations on the horizon for uh, Q2 of 2022, and the lengthy and complex process uh, in Asia, we will focus all of our efforts for Acutus here in the United States. Meanwhile, our Univero portfolio is making good progress. We've now defined clear details of an ancillary or supplementary clinical study in China. We're working out the final details with our partners and the Chinese regulators on the control concept as well as logistics, but our partner has already obtained IRB approval or the equivalent, an ethics committee approval from the first of three clinical sites in China for this small scale study. Also, our partner, Anar, in Colombia has been successful to gain regulatory uh, preliminary registration for Univero and just days ago, we've sold and shipped the first commercial Univero system and cartridges over to Colombia. As far as Vietnam goes, they're very much still in the lockdown scenario given COVID, so we have much less uh, visibility on that. But one of the clear areas of business focus and growth for us is our RS Genetics next-gen sequencing and artificial intelligence powered bioinformatics suite of products. We've integrated the data from Lighthouse into RSDB and the letter will be our core bioinformatics platform that we're moving forward with. Lighthouse is not a platform that we, as a standalone platform, continue to be taken forward. As RS Cloud and RSDB, both from a technological, but also from a commercial potential standpoint, in our view, are far superior. And again, the data from Lighthouse has been fully integrated into RSDB. We anticipate growing the RS business along the software, services, and longer term also kits and products. To that end, we've recently strengthened our commercial team at RS Genetics in Europe with the hire of a very experienced business development manager. But we're also looking to bring in RS Genetics and its solutions to the US market. And to that end, we'll strengthen the executive team for RS Genetics in the US to add both commercial as well as operations resources in the US in 2022. And finally, is there any news on the appointment of a new CFO? I understand the, the, uh, the curiosity here, and yes, most certainly there is. Uh, as we've stated in recent public announcements, the search has been completed, I would say successfully completed. Uh, we have identified our CFO. We have all the pieces in place, and uh, as soon as our board can make the formal appointment, uh, we'll publicly communicate that. Uh, we're excited about the individual who we expect to join Option and the executive team as our new CFO, bringing extensive expertise, not only in finance and the capital markets, but also specifically in diagnostics, global operations, commercial operations. So watch this space for news in due course. Thanks so much, Oliver. Really appreciate you taking the time. That's all the time we have for today. For analysis of options, long-term prospects, do visit Edison Research. Just click on the link at the end.